Well, good evening, Allison Park Church. How are you tonight? What a privilege to be in Pittsburgh and to be with you at the start of this new series, Reclaim the Table. Uh, we can get in a really big hurry in our lives. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And this series is an opportunity for us to hit pause and in the midst of summer and some of the rhythm changes that that provides for us to slow down a little bit and actually reclaim the table, perhaps at home, in your kitchen, or with your small group. And so I encourage you to dive into this series. All of the messages, you're going to be able to get a discussion guide right out of the Allison Park Church app to be able to talk about what we're going to talk about tonight with your kids, with your uh, family, your friends, your groups. And so I encourage you to do that. And really for me to be here, it's like coming back home. And I just want to honor Pastor Jeff and Melody, who really, Pastor Jeff is my pastor. And they have been such a big influence and blessing in my life. And your church really has given birth to our church and our ministry in Philadelphia. And so to be here is really a privilege. And I want to honor my wife who grew up here at Allison Park Church. Why don't you stand, Leah? This is Leah Edwards was her maiden name. And we have been married now for 11 years, and we have four kids. And they are 10 and under. Our oldest just turned 10. And so we're having a blast as a family. And I just am so happy to be here. How many of you are ready to lean in tonight as we begin to reclaim the table? And I want to tell you a story from Mark chapter 6. It's a miracle story. It's uh, the only miracle account that's told in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all decided that we should really pay attention to what Jesus is going to do in this story. And so at all of the campuses, we're going to look at this miracle together. And we're going to read through it just verse by verse. But I want to start with what I think is the key verse of the entire story. And so here is the stage. Let me set it for you. Jesus is out with his disciples and they're teaching and there's a huge crowd of people, probably 15 to 20,000 people who are gathered up on the uh, hillside listening to Jesus teach. And the disciples start to sense what I can start to sense when I'm speaking and maybe it's going a little bit long is the stir, you know. Everybody's stomach is starting to growl a little bit, and everybody's getting a little hungry. And so they come to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, listen, you've really been preaching a long time, and it's getting late. We need to get these people out of here before Eaton Park closes so they can go get a smiley face cookie. And uh, if we, you know, we got disaster if we don't do that. And Jesus says something to them that shocked them, but I think is so encouraging for us to see because I believe he's saying the same thing to us as well this weekend. And here's what he says to them. You give them something to eat. They're saying, Jesus, we got to get these people out of here. Get them out to the restaurant. They're getting hungry. And Jesus says, okay, you feed them. And so I want us to pause and think about this because that's what I think Jesus is saying to us as well tonight. You give them something to eat, which, by the way, that's what we were doing literally today, everybody, is giving 300,000 people something to eat. But it indicates what Jesus' ministry was all about, that he hadn't come to just put on a show. He had come to start a movement. And what that meant is that he not only had to be performing miracles himself, but he had to actually hand off that power to the disciples and the others who were around him so that they could reproduce what he was doing. And so he is going to now at this stage in his ministry begin to push it out to them and say, no, 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 you heal the sick, you preach the gospel, you give them something to eat, which tells us that Christianity, everybody, is not a spectator sport. It's something that we can be involved in. Jesus says you with all of your hang-ups, with all of your habits, with all of your questions, with all of your doubts, you give them. Who's that? That's everybody with an earshot of your life. That's your coworkers, your neighbors, your stepmom. You give
give them something to eat. And whether you realize it or not, how many of you know that everybody around us in this city and in these communities here in greater Pittsburgh, people are starving, not just for another meal, but people are starving for community. People are starving for grace. They're hungry for belonging. They're hungry for forgiveness. All of the things that start coming out of our lives as we're getting really close to Jesus, people are hungry for it. And so Jesus is going to say to us this weekend, all right, as we reclaim the table, you go out and let's put some, let's put some hope in the crock pot for people this week. Let's marinate some friendship on the grill. Let's make some sandwiches that are layered with faith and love and compassion. And let's go meet the needs of people around us. You and you and you and you. It's Jesus saying, you know, you step in and foster that baby. You step up and lead that group. You pray for your neighbor to be healed. And so as we begin to look at what it is to not only see a miracle, because I often read the Gospels and I think, man, wouldn't it have been amazing to have been there to see Jesus feed the 5,000, to see Jesus heal the blind man? And how many of you would agree that would be pretty amazing to see one of those miracles? But I'll tell you what, is that to see it is not life-changing. And we know that because the disciples saw it over and over and over and over, but their lives weren't changed until something greater happened, and that is that for you and I, not only to see a miracle, but to participate in a miracle, to be in the middle of a miracle, to be a part of seeing it all happen, that's what begins to change our lives. And so, how many of you want to be a part of that, to literally participate in a miracle? Jesus is saying, you give them something to eat. So, as we look at this amazing story, I want to just give you four principles for participating in a miracle. And here's the first one, jot this down, is that ministry happens at inconvenient moments. Have you realized this? It'd be nice to say, God, I'm available and I want you to use my life to impact the people around me. And so I'm available on Thursday from 9 to 11. Use me. Is not how it usually happens, that ministry is often an interruption of what we actually had planned. Ministry is often inconvenient and something that happens in, in, in the margins of life. And so let's begin to look at this story in Mark 6, starting now in verse 30. It says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. So this is coming again at a place where Jesus has sent out his disciples, and in teams, they're actually doing what he had been doing, healing the sick and preaching the gospel. And now they come back, and they're giving Jesus the stories. Jesus, it's working. We prayed for this guy, and we met this woman, and they're talking about what God has been doing. It's been a, a busy ministry season, and they're telling the stories. And it says in verse 31 that because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. How many of you ever been so busy that you just forgot to eat breakfast? You forgot to eat lunch. You were just from one place to the next. That's what this season of ministry was for Jesus and the disciples. It was action-packed ministry. They didn't have, it was just going and there wasn't time to slow down or to eat. And so Jesus is going to say to his disciples now, okay, let's, let's call time out and let's get away to the rural part of Galilee, to the rural part of the countryside, and we're going to decompress a little bit and we're going to rest and we're going to get refueled for the next phase of ministry. And so it says as we continue that they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And so Jesus' grand plan, I'm sure the disciples were excited about it. We're going to get some alone time with Jesus, a day off. We're going to get to rest. And so they get into this boat. Well, everybody saw them get into the boat, and they decided, we're going to go meet Jesus. And so here's what you may not know about the geography is that they had to run north 
above the Sea of Galilee, probably to the Jordan River, and to get where it was shallow enough to cross the river, they would have had to then run all the way back down the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus and the disciples go all the way across the lake. They get out of the boat, and all of these folks are there. (sighs) What's up, Jesus? They ran a half marathon around the lake to get to Jesus, and Jesus and the disciples are thinking, we came out here because nobody was supposed to be out here. And have you ever been in the moment of life where you're just so tired and drained that you just wanted to, you had nothing left to give, and so the last thing you wanted to see was people who expected you to give them something. And so here they are, and they're hoping to rest, and they're hoping to just disconnect from it all, and the crowds show up. And it's such, a, it's such a lesson to us, because this is life, and if you want your life to be used by God, if you want to be a part of a miracle, making a difference in people's lives, we have to understand that people are not a disruption from our plans. People are actually the point. And it's oftentimes when we're tired, when we have something else on our minds, when we're wanting to break away or do our own thing, that God will give us an opportunity, that it's the interruptions and the inconvenience that that it often are the life-changing moments that God presents to us. And so it's amazing to me what Jesus does, because listen, Jesus at this time in his life was hurting himself. His cousin and really one of his best friends, John the Baptist, had just been beheaded by Herod, And so now he is here and he's hurting emotionally and he's tired physically. But here's what it says about our Lord and Savior. That when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. How many of you are glad for the compassion of Jesus? That he is willing not only to empathize with us, but compassion. It comes from a Latin word that simply means to suffer with. That he's willing to suffer even as he's tired and drained emotionally and grieving the loss of his cousin. To enter into the suffering of the people and to give even out of his fatigue. And to begin to minister to them and teach them. And that is the heart of of God. If you're here tonight and you are suffering and you are struggling, you need to know this about God that if you could put a stethoscope up to the heart of God, here's what you would hear God's heartbeat saying, others. 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 And tonight his heartbeat is for you and it's for me and he calls us to live with that same heartbeat. What a privilege. When ministry happens, at the inconvenient moments. Now, here's a second thought I want to give to you tonight is that the right place to be is in over your head. And so if you feel tonight a little desperate, like God's given you something to do that you can't quite pull off with the resources at your disposal, good news, you're in the right place. Because when God comes and gives us an opportunity, it, 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 here's the reality, is that your net, what, you, what you have to work with, it's never going to feel like it's enough. The time you have available, the money you have available, the talent, the ability that you have available, it's never going to feel like it's enough. And so that's the right place to be in over your head. And so as we continue reading here is what we begin to see in verse 35. By this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. And it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And so here's their response to Jesus. They start making all of these excuses. Jesus, we got to get the people out of here. We got we to gotta get them out to get something to eat. We're out here in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing around. And, and it's really late. The sun's starting to go down. Let's get, let's get the people out of here. And if you have ever... Uh, felt like, man, you're just, we're just not in the right place to be able to take care of these needs, that we can begin to feel that, I think, even about our lives, that we feel hidden, that we feel anonymous, that we don't have what it's going to take to meet the need in front of us. And so we can come to the same conclusion as the disciples. This is the wrong place. I'm the wrong guy, Jesus. 
Let's send these people away so that somebody else can give them something to eat and somebody else can take care of this need that is there. And we can begin to think this way that uh, we're in the wrong place. And so I think as we begin to look at this, it's so encouraging to me because if you've ever felt this way, you know, that, man, I want to be a great husband, but I'm just not romantic enough. And I want to be a great mom, but I'm just not patient enough. And I'd love to be a great leader, but I'm just not talented enough. And I think that we can feel like I just don't have enough. I'm not in the right place. I'm not positioned. I'm not the right person for God to use in this situation. And and so I think we all know that feeling. And here's the tension that Jesus is saying, you give them something to eat. And we've got this other voice in the back of our head that's just nagging and saying, Don't be silly. Don't be crazy. You're just from the North Hills of Pittsburgh. You're not a wealthy person. You've never been to Bible college. You don't have an extroverted personality. And you could not possibly be the person to do this. And so we start to think with all of our own excuses, this is the wrong place. And it could be that it's actually the right place. That if you feel in over your head, because the right place to be is in over your head. Your head. Now, here's what I want to do is just kind of back up a minute in the story, because we're looking at the exchange here at the end of the day. It's getting late, but I want you to see what began to happen even at the start of the day, because it's so interesting. So we're going to actually skip over to John's gospel. He tells the same story. He gives us a few more details. And so let's look at John and we'll put up this next scripture, John chapter six. And here's what it says, that when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, so we're at the beginning of the day now, he said to Philip, that's one of his disciples, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? So at the beginning of the day, who was the first person to actually recognize that these folks are going to get hungry later on? It was Jesus. And it was Jesus before the disciples ever saw a problem who planted the idea in Philip's head. Hey, Philip, look at all these people who are coming. How do you think we're going to feed them? How do you think they're going to be able to eat? Now, so much of what Jesus does in our lives, how many of you know it's a setup? And so why is Jesus asking him him this? So interesting. Look at verse 6. He asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. Jesus had the whole thing scripted out already. But remember, this isn't about him now. This is about his disciples taking over and beginning to do it themselves. And so he's going to build his disciples through this exchange. And so he does this to test Philip. Now, what's Philip's response? You think he's going to say, oh, Jesus, I don't know, but I'm sure you got a plan and I'd love to figure it out with you. Not quite that much faith. (laughs) Here's Philip's response. Philip answered in verse 7, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. He actually says 200 denarii, which was about 200 days wages, almost seven months worth of work. So Philip is the guy in the team meeting that, you know, once the big goal is thrown out there, he looks at it up there on the whiteboard and he says, ah, nope, impossible can't happen. Jesus, even if we were working for seven months, we wouldn't have enough even for the people to just even get a little snack or a little bite. It's just not, it's just not going to happen. And so Jesus just kind of smiles at him and says, all right, brother, why don't you just go work on it a little bit? And so we're going to fast forward again back. We're going to go back to Mark 6, back to the end of the day, because I want you to see what begins to take place here. Back to Mark 6, verse 37. But he answered, you give them something to eat. So the disciples are saying, let's get them out of here. You give them something to eat. They said to him, the rest of the disciples now, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Word for word, what do they say to Jesus? Exactly what Philip said to him earlier in the day. And so here's what I think is happening. You should put your... Uh, imagination cap on with me for a minute, is that Jesus early on, that he pulls Philip over, he says, hey, look at all these people, how are we going to feed them? And he says, let's do it, let's give them something to eat. And Philip says, Jesus is impossible, not even 200 denarii, not even half a year's wages. And so Jesus says, well, go get the disciples together, see what you guys can come up with. So Philip goes, he huddles up the disciples, 
hey, guys, come on over here. Just met with Jesus. They're like, hey, what's going on? And he says, well, Jesus wants to feed the people. And the disciples are thinking, what? Yeah, Jesus wants to feed the people. But yeah, I know, I know. I told him. I told him. I told him not even 200 denarii. I told him not even half a year's wages would be enough to feed the people. How many of you know that you get into a team, into a group around the table, that even the person who doesn't have the most influence, as soon as they get negative and pessimistic, all of a sudden becomes the most influential voice in the room. And now at the end of the day, the disciples are just parroting back to Jesus the negativity, the complaining, the pessimism of Philip. And they've all kind of come to this conclusion that, oh, can't happen, can't be done, not even 200 denarii, not even half a year's wages. And I just want to challenge you tonight to be a different kind of leader, to be the one in the room that when God surfaces the goal, that instead of just beginning to speak words that are pessimistic, words of complaining and negativity, to be the one who recognizes that we may not have the resources we think to get the job done, but we serve a big God, and he does, and maybe through us, if we put our faith to work, something miraculous could happen tonight. Listen, if you want to be used by God, that means that you're going to face some battles you can't win in your own strength, some mountains that you can't climb through your own initiative. And so let's be the ones who look to God and recognize that God, if we're trying to accomplish something that we can do without him, it's probably not him. And he wants you to know that what he's called you to do for him can't be done without him. So the right place to be is in over your head. I just don't know if it's enough. Jesus is going to say, give it to me. Because that's the third thing I want you to see. If you give what you have to God, he'll use it. Give God what you have, and he'll use it. Let's continue reading here the next part of our story, verse 38. He says to them, How many loaves do you have? Now look at me real real close. I think that's what Jesus is asking you tonight. Well, how many friends do you have? How much money do you have? How much time do you have? I don't think he's ever going to ask you to give something you don't have. He's never going to ask you to give something he hasn't already put in your hands and in your heart. And he looks and he says, how many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Now, these are not big Wonder Loaf breads like you would get at Giant Eagle. These are little round pieces of flat bread and not the record-setting bass that you caught on the 4th of July and lied to all your friends and family about that wasn't really that big. This is a little boy's snack. It's a little boy's lunch. And... That's what they find, and they bring it to Jesus, and they say, this is it. This is all we got. And Jesus looks at it, and it's so amazing to me, because I think so, much, so many of us in John, it, there's actually this little detail, that when the disciples found the lunch, they actually asked this question, what is this among so many? And I think oftentimes we look at what we have, and it seems so insignificant. It seems so small that we think, well, nothing good could come out of this. And because we don't give God what we have, it never multiplies. It never becomes anything greater because the multiplying takes place in the giving. And so they say, well, this is all we got, Jesus. And Jesus takes it. And you know what I love about this miracle is that Jesus could have performed this miracle in So many different ways. I mean, he could have just walked through the crowd just waving his hand, you know. Filet. Salmon. Popcorn. Cracker Jacks. Salad with French fries on it. Primani Brothers. Philly cheesesteaks. That would have probably been even cooler. And some might argue more memorable. But he doesn't do it that way. How does he do it? He uses what they have. He uses the kid's lunch. And what I love about that is that this kid, you know, the reason that the scriptures say 5,000 were there is because they only counted the men. 
There would have been probably 15 to 20,000 when you count the women and the children. And so he takes the little kid, the, the kid who isn't even going to show up in the count. The kid who isn't even going to be counted at the end of the day. He says, I'll use his lunch. I'll use his availability. I'll use his willingness. And this is what our God does, everybody, is that if you will give him not what somebody else has, not what you wish you had, but what you actually have, he'll take it and multiply it and use it to get way more out of it than you ever could. We've seen this as a church, you know. Eight years ago, we came into Philly and uh, and, and and had our first service, and we had such a hard time finding a venue that would let us start having services, and we had so many closed doors, and finally we found a, a, a public high school that had no air conditioning, and it was ghetto, but it's what we had, and so we said, God, we'll use what we've got, and this is what you've given us, and and so we brought in a commercial air conditioning unit, and our team set it up every single Sunday morning and brought in a generator on a trailer, and we ran ductwork up the steps into the balcony and draped it over the balcony, and I don't think it did anything to cool the room down. Uh, but, I mean, it's what we had, and so we were using what we had, and then God moved us to a banqueting facility where we didn't even have any storage, and we had to put everything in trailers and drive it over every single Sunday morning, and then we moved to another high school that was even more ghetto than the first one, where we were just rolling carts and setting up rocking chairs and setting up coffee machines and pulling the mice out of the Cheerios before we gave them to the children and stomping on the roaches. There were a lot of Sundays we had more mice than people in the building, but it's what we had, and we just... Sunday after Sunday, 365 Sundays in a row. But who's counting? I was. Took what we had and said, God, maybe you could use this. And he did. And for seven years and 365 Sundays in a row, God met people in those locations with the setup and the teardown and everything else. And lives were impacted and lives were were changed as we just said, God, this is all we got. doesn't seem like much. It smells. It's hot. Maybe you could do something with it. And, you know, God had an amazing thing in mind as we were just serving and giving him what we had. He was working on something behind the scenes until this past fall in October, we moved into our first permanent building, and God did such a miracle on our behalf. Listen, we got a building with a gym and a cafeteria and a parking lot, which in Philadelphia in the city is like gold, and uh, all of the property, an $8 million piece of property and facility that God gave us, everybody, for $1. Come on. You can do better than that. One dollar. I think we got a, We might have a picture of it we could put up. But my oldest daughter, Gabby, when we told her that God had given us the building for a dollar, she said, why didn't you get it for a penny? <laughs> I said, you're right, babe. Just dollar doesn't get you what it used to. And I think so many of us, because we're looking at the time we have, the money we have, the connections we have, the job we have, and saying, what is this among so much need, never letting it go, never trusting God with it? Well, God, I'm just not an upfront person. And so you don't step out, you don't serve. God is saying, I didn't create you to be an upfront person. Be the behind the scenes person I created you to be. Give me what you have. Well, God, I don't have this personality, but God, I don't have this education, but God, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. And we're so consumed with what we don't have that we forget all God needs is one little bit of what we do have, and he can use it. Number four, and we'll close with this thought. If you focus on the needs of others, God will take care of you. It's interesting to me to think that in a crowd of 15 to 20,000 people, how many of you know this little kid was not the only one who brought some food? Yet out of all of these people, he's the only one who offers it. He's the only one who makes it available. Why are there so many 
who are unwilling to let go of what they've come with. I think it's because it's so easy for us to begin to live with and slip into a scarcity mentality. And here's what we think. Well, if I give it away for everybody else to eat, what will I eat? And we begin to, we begin to fall for this lie that there's only so much to go around. And if I give what I have to God, what is going to be left for me? And we don't recognize the truth, which is that you can never outgive God. That if you begin to give what you have to him, he's always going to pour back in more and more and more than you ever would have had in the first place. So let's finish the story. Mark 6, verse 39. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. This was maybe the greatest miracle of the night. You ever tried to get people to move seats in the middle of service? Jesus did it. And taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Interesting question, and you could talk about this around your tables uh, tonight and tomorrow and this week. When did the miracle take place? Doesn't tell us exactly. Have some fun with that question. When did the miracle take place? Here's my hunch, my theory. It wasn't that Jesus broke the bread and all of a sudden meals for thousands were on the table there in front of them. He broke the bread for each of the 12 disciples, and they took it, and as they began to distribute it, each time, there was just more. Here you go. There was more. Here you go. There was more. And I've kind of, you know, trash-talked them a little bit, thrown some shade on them in this message, but the reality is that in the end of, at the end of the day, they had the faith to take it. And even though it didn't seem like to begin to give it away, and it just kept coming and coming and coming, and God used a little bit of faith that they did have to obey, and they're giving it out, they're giving it out, they're giving it out. And here's the detail that I love. They all ate and were satisfied. You're trying, if you're here tonight and you're just kind of investigating who's God and what's this all about, this is the heart of God. He's extravagant. How much grace does he have? More than enough. How much forgiveness? More than enough. How much hope if you're here tonight in a dark season of your life? More than enough. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. Why 12? How many of them were there? 12. One for each of them. If you take care of the needs of the people around you, then God will take care of you. You know what you'll have at the end of the day? More than enough. Letting go leads to leftovers and the opportunity to participate in a miracle that will not only change the life of the person you're feeding, but your life as well. God didn't design you to sit on the sidelines. Get in the game. Give him whatever you have and watch him use it. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your miracle working power that can take what we have, even though it's small and finite, and inadequate, and somehow use it to make a difference in the lives of the people around us. You give us purpose. You give us meaning. And for that, I'm so, so grateful. For the people who are listening to this and watching this now, I pray that you would speak to them calling and purpose and destiny right now in this moment and show them the opportunities that are all around them to use what they have to make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you just to keep your eyes closed for one more moment.
nobody moving around at all of our campuses. I don't know where you are today spiritually in your life, what's going on in your world, what brought you to this service. But I know that there are no accidents in the kingdom of God. And his presence is here right now. And he has a plan for you that's greater than the plan you have for yourself. And if you don't know God, if your life is not right with him, if the truth is that you're living out of a relationship with God, you need to know this tonight, that the greatest miracle of all that Jesus wants you to experience is the washing away of your sin and disobedience and the infilling of grace and forgiveness in his precious spirit. And if you're here tonight and you need to experience and receive that hope in your life, good news, Jesus died in your place. He rose from the dead to give you the hope of a new life. And I want to give you an opportunity. If you say, Brad, that's me. My life's not right with God. But tonight I want to take a step. I want to make things right. Whatever campus you're at, God is moving right now. And I want to simply ask you at the count of three, if that's you, to Lift up your hand. We're not going to embarrass you. It's just to take a simple physical step to say, Jesus, I need you in my life. And he's here tonight. One, two, three. Go ahead. Lift up your hand. Thank you so much. All over the room, hands are going up. Lift up your hand at all of our campuses. We're going to pray together tonight. God is here. He's moving right now in this moment, changing lives. Let's pray together. And I'm going to ask those of you that raised your hand, simply pray this prayer with me. There's nothing magical about the words, but to be able to verbalize the faith that God's putting in your heart, that's what this is about. And I'm just going to help you do that, and all of us are going to help you do that. And so everybody in the room, let's pray this prayer together. And if you raised your hand, pray this from your heart. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I've sinned. I've blown it. I'm desperate for your grace. So come now and change me. Wash my heart clean. I want to know you. I want to follow you. I believe you died for me. And you rose from the dead. Now change my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together and praise Jesus for his saving grace in our lives. And listen, if you raised your hand or if you prayed that prayer, would you do one more thing for me tonight? No matter what campus you're at, go to the Welcome Center as soon as this service is dismissed. We would love to meet you and give you some resources as you start this brand new journey of faith. And so right now we're going to turn it back over to the campus pastors at all of the locations to uh, close the service for the communion moment.